title for me. Mike calls me and I, and this is my title on the ECBS banner. I'm the mm -hmm. minister of education. Oh, yes. <laughs> Which I, which I like that I, I Mike gave me a really good title. Um, I am going to note two things very quickly before we start. Mm -hmm. All of the virtual meetings have been recorded. All virtual meetings we do going forward will be recorded. If you want to watch them, go to the same link you went to tonight, find the name of the meeting you want to watch and just click the orange button next to it that says presentation and you can watch it over again as much as you want. Um, we'll keep that going. We're still, uh, you can still download any documents, PowerPoints, that kind of thing through the uh, Essex website. Okay. If you just go to, oh, actually, you know what I can do? Because we're on our platform, which is always wonderful. I can share my screen quickly. And everyone can see. Oh. So, oh, Megan's going to be here. Cool. Yes. So this is the Essex County website. It's linked at the bottom of every email we send out. It's in every newsletter. Um, if you want to register your apiary, first page, apiary registration, this will link you on over to the state website. Uh, it's also up here on the top of every single page. Um, if you want to go over to the NJBA state website, that's right here as well, um, to sign up and join ECBS or renew your membership or make changes to your membership, just click join NJBA up here under about us. Super, super simple. If you want any of the past um, newsletters, any documents we've sent out, that's right under news and meeting documents. They're all available. Um, we usually upload things about a weekish out afterwards. And under calendar, you will find the agenda for usually the next year, including times, virtual meeting links, speakers, topics, and location. Um, you don't know the Essex County website, now you do. It's a great resource. And uh, take us home, Landy. So, Justin, you're going to advance the frames for me, or I don't have I can it. actually give you that ability. OK, good. Um, then you should do that. There you go. Cool. OK, nice. I like that. Oh, and I've got a little red dot here so I can point to things. All right, <laughs> we'll do that. Okay, so this is a talk that I gave at EAS, and and I also gave it to um, Beekeeping Club down in Virginia, and it, it seems to be a very popular talk. Everybody that I've given this to has... Um, really liked it. I'm not sure why it's so popular, but um, I guess it it summarizes some things or points some things out to help people um, really figure out what's going with their bee, what's going on with their bees a little bit better than than they were able to before. So so hopefully we'll be able to do that tonight. Um, if you have questions, just type them into the chat area there, send message to public chat, and Justin will interrupt me if it's a question about what we're doing, you know, what we're talking about right now, and ask the question. I, I'd rather have it that way than saving all the questions until the end, uh, because then, you know, we've forgotten what we were talking about. So ask your questions when they happen, when they, you know, you know occur to you. And we'll we'll discuss the the questions then. Okay, so reading the frames, um, you know, beekeepers are kind of like doctors, right? Because you don't take your bees to the vet. Can you imagine we put them all maybe in a swarm box or something, and you know, load them in the back of the car and take them to the vet? And unless the vet is our own. Jennifer Greenwald, who actually happens to be a veterinarian, you know, your your cat or dog vet is going to totally flip out. I know my vet loves the fact. On my phone, that. so thank you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there's you're here. Good. <laughs> I got. I talked her through it on the phone. <laughs> there you go, Landy. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I take my vet, uh, who's wonderful, I, and I adore her. I take her a jar of honey every time we go and see her, um, and she loves the honey, but I'm pretty sure she would not want to come and see my bees. So who is the veterinarian for your honeybees? Well, you are, right? That's the case. You are their vet. Um, and just like any medical professional, you examine the animal, the organism, which is the super colony, which is your honeybee um, colony. And, and by examining them, you can determine whether the bees are sick or well, and if they're ill, what is the disease that's present? Um, and if you're confused about that, you would call in a super vet like Megan, <laughs> your state apiarist. So, Right. Beekeepers are like doctors. Beekeepers examine. Doctors examine their patients. Doctors run tests on their patients, right? They talk to them to find out what their symptoms and concerns are. And if the patient is ill, the doctor treats them. And beekeepers examine their bees. When we look in the brood nest and look at the brood frames, we may run tests on them, like alcohol washes or perhaps a test for American fowl brood. And if we find or determine that they need to be treated for a disease or a parasite, we can treat them. But what's the biggest difference between what we do and what a doctor does? Well, it's kind of similar to the issue that a veterinarian has. We can't really talk to them. You know, I can't say, okay, Queen Petunia, how are you feeling today? You know, I see a little funky something in the brood nest here. Can you tell me what that's all about? Not going to happen. So we have to find other ways to communicate with our bees because they're talking to us. We don't speak bee, but they are talking and communicating with us. And what we need to do is we need to learn their language. So they'll tell us exactly what's going on with them. And we have to observe and interpret their behavior in order to correctly determine what it is that they're telling us. Can anybody tell me what's going on in that photo? What are those bees doing? It's a cool thing. If I had video, you would see the bees on the side here going up and down and up and down like that in place. Is that washboarding? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's washboarding. Um, and if it's genetic, thank you. Becky says <laughs> washboarding, okay. It's yeah, genetic, we don't know why they do it. We don't Lady, know if they're laying down second. footprint pheromone, if they're Kathleen, washing. you might wanna shut off your video because we're recording the session. It's up to you. Everybody gets to see Kathleen too. <laughs> I don't, I don't mind if she doesn't, but not everyone is comfortable with being recorded. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah. And we don't always understand everything that they do, but there's actually quite like washboarding. Washboarding is one of their behaviors that is really pretty poorly understood. There's a lot of guessing about it, and not every colony does it, but we really don't know why they do it. It's cute when they do, but... Who knows why? So there is a lot though that we can in fact figure out, um, but we have to know what to look for. So something else that we're like beekeepers, um, I think is we're like detectives because detectives gather clues by observing things using their senses and they interpret the clues and arrive at conclusions. Um, and a good beekeeper is also a good detective. How, how many of you guys, I hate that I can't like look at people and have people raise their hands and stuff. That just like drives me nuts. But I hope a lot of you have seen this movie. This, is, this movie starring Ian McClellan is Mr. Holmes. And it's based on, it's based on a story um, by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. It's really an excellent movie. And um, I'm a big fan of the Sherlock Holmes stories by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. In fact, I'm listening to 
um, an audio recording of the whole series right now on audible.com. And I'm having a good time with that. Um, I read them first when I was a little girl and I have since reread the complete works, um, all of the Sherlock Holmes novels and stories, probably at least half a dozen times. So if you are familiar with them, you'll know that Sir Arthur had Sherlock Holmes retire and he kept bees on the Sussex Downs. So that was what he did in his final days was he was a beekeeper. And um, it was a very appropriate occupation for this brilliant detective. So um, if you're interested, read a story, a story called The Adventure of the Lion's Mane, which takes place. And there are several references to Holmes's beekeeping endeavors. Um, so some of the things I, I pulled out a few quotes from um, the Holmes stories that I think apply particularly well to beekeeping. Uh, data, 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 I can't make bricks without clay. You, you know, this is like you have to do your alcohol wash in order to determine whether your mite loads are high enough to treat. And then you have to follow up with an alcohol wash to make sure that your treatment worked. This one I really like. You know my method, he's talking to Watson. It is founded upon the observation of trifles. Um, I once watched Tim Schuler go into a colony and point to one little group of bees on the top of a frame. And one of those bees was shaking rather uncontrollably and the others were kind of hurting her off the frame. And he looked at this, you know, out of, and there were, thousands of bees visible. And Tim focused right in on that little group and said, we're looking at chronic, chronic bee paralysis virus right there. Um, so the observation of trifles and one little honeybee is certainly a trifle. Um, you see, but you do not observe. The distinction is clear. A lot of us do that. The evidence will be right there in front of us, in front of our eyes, but we're not really seeing it. It's not going into our brains. We're not observing what we what's in our eyes, in our field of view. Um, so there, there's a lot of tidbits there. And, and I think that there's a great deal that can apply to bee, beekeepers. Um, so we're detectives. And you can learn a lot about bee biology and behavior by reading, studying. Don't go on the internet. <laughs> There's so, so much misinformation. Um, hopefully working with an experienced mentor, if you can do that. You can train yourself to be a good observer and to interpret your observations. Um, and if you continue to do that consistently, your experience will become more valuable and you will be a better beekeeper. So learning to observe, training yourself to observe and record your observations will make you a better beekeeper. So when we're looking at our bees, what exactly are we evaluating? We're their veterinarian, we're their doctors. What are we looking at? There's only four things, guys, that you ever need to worry about. But every time you go in the hive, you should be looking at these four things and evaluating them. Strength. Okay, how do you track strength? I like to record during an inspection how many frames I'm looking at are covered with bees. So in spring, you put in a package. Say you, you, you get a package of bees and you shake them in. You're going to have... I don't know about deeps, but if they're in um, mediums, you're going to wind up with anywhere between nine and maybe 15 frames of bees in a three pound package, you know, depending on how many died in transit. Um, so let's call it 10 frames of bees. That's what you start out with. As the queen, they draw the comb, the queen begins to lay and the size of the colony grows. So maybe at an inspection three weeks later, you're gonna be seeing 17 frames of bees. 
And then perhaps two weeks after that, you're going to be up to 22 frames of bees. So if that number starts to suddenly decrease, there's a problem. Something happened. So maybe in mid-May, you had, or, or all right, let's say May 1st, you recorded 26 medium frames covered in bees. And then May 7th, you go back and take a look and all you have is 15 frames covered in bees. What happened? He swarmed, right? So if you record that number, you're not simply saying to yourself, gee, I thought there were more bees in here. You know how many bees are in there because you wrote it down. Okay, so that's strength. Strength is important. When I go into the winter, I want to see, I would really like to see pretty much every single frame covered in bees when I go into the winter. And for me, that's, you know, 27 medium frames because I run three mediums in the brood nest of nine frames each, drawn comb. So 27 frames total. If they're weaker than about 25 frames going into winter, I'm quite concerned about that colony. I may decide to combine them. Or I may beef them up from somebody else that has a lot of bees. Um, so strength is important. Health. Obviously, if there's brood disease, if there's a disease of adults, Adriana, Adriana Compagnoni had um, chronic bee paralysis virus, was observing a lot of that shaking of the bees this past year. And there's not really much you can do about it. It's a virus, you know, just like the common cold. And now COVID-19, we don't have a treatment for it, at least not yet. Um, but that's something that you want to observe and you want to be aware that they have it. Uh, of course, other things like um, European fowl brood, we can treat. We can give them teramycin, an antibiotic, and we can actually cure them of that disease. Varroa mites, varroaos varroaosis. I can never say that word, but but an excessive, you know, the <laughs> yeah, the damage, right? PMS, we used to call it, okay, parasitic mite syndrome. Horrible. And you can do something about it. You can kill the mites. Um, so health is extremely important. Queen status. <coughs> Excuse me. Are they queen right? Do they have a good queen? Or is she poorly mated? Is she a drone layer? Um, are they queenless? Do they have laying workers? Those are really important things that you've got to evaluate. If that queen is not on the job, the colony's dead. You know, they will not survive. They cannot survive. They can recover from chronic bee paralysis virus. They can recover from a little bit of chalk brood. They can't recover from no queen. So that's a critical evaluation there. And of course, their food stores. Um, Charlie was saying that his bees are going through two gallons of syrup a day. Um, I've got bees at the kennel right now that are storing nectar in the extracted honey supers that I put above the inner covers. So I don't know what's going on. This is just a really weird year. I also got nectar that I have never seen before. It's a dark amber spring honey. I have no idea where it came from. And I've got about half a ton of it. Um, so some of this is, you know, these past couple of years have been really bizarre. You, you beekeepers, I feel sorry for you. You have, everything is different. It's different from what we've experienced for 20 years. It, it, two really odd years. But food stores have to be appropriate to the time of year. You've got a new package on new foundation and you're feeding them. You're not going to expect them to have a full medium bursting in honey that you can barely lift, right? But that same package in October going into winter had better have a solid 60 pounds of honey. So as we examine our colonies, let's make our first observation, which is we're going to look at 
the entrance of the hive and what's going on. Bees coming and going. Um, a lot of new beekeepers stop there. They say, okay, they're, they're going in and out. They must be fine. And then they never go in the hive. And that's just a really bad idea because um, they'll be coming and going until the very last bee dies and then there won't be anything happening. But if you don't go in the hive and observe what's happening inside, you won't know. You'll never know. Um, so good entrance activity is great, but it's not a guarantee that the bees are okay. If there's very few bees coming and going, that can indicate a problem. More likely than not, it does indicate a problem, but occasionally you'll have very little entrance activity. You'll pop the lid and the boxes will be full of bees. That can happen. It often happens after they've swarmed and the, um, the capped brood that the old queen has laid has hatched out. So, so you've got this huge population of very young bees and not very many foragers. So there's disproportionately little entrance activity for a very strong hive. But typically, you've got a strong hive inside, a lot of bees inside, and you have a lot of entrance activity too. Um, are they on a nectar flow? You can tell by looking at how they fly. Bees on it, there's a couple of cues to whether they're on a nectar flow or not. Kathleen and I were emailing about this earlier today. Um, you can tell by white wax that they build in the hole in the inner cover um, because they only build wax when they've got nectar coming in. It takes nectar to make wax. But also they fly in a very distinctive pattern. If it, it's in and out or out and in, out and in, out and in, they're, they're very directed, purposeful flight. They're on a mission. They're going to get that nectar and bring it back. You don't see them like lottie dotting around and, you know, just kind of not orientation flight. It's like they're busy. They're going. So that's distinctive. And with a little experience and correlating the way they fly with what's going on inside are, you know, if do you shake a frame and, and all this nectar comes out? That's a cute. That's a clue, right? They're on a nectar flow. Um, Correlate that with the flight activity at the entrance. So you can recognize when they're on a flow by looking at the, the entrance activity. Um, is the colony being robbed? That's another one. That's pretty distinctive. You see fighting at the entrance. You see clouds of bees around any crack, any little hole. Um, and, and there's, you know, huge amount of activity. Zigzag flight. They, they actually... They look kind of shifty, you know, robbers. They're, they're, they obviously don't belong there. So that's something else you want to observe and correlate to what's happening inside. Um, are they bearding? Huge beards of bees hanging out the front porch. Well, it's probably just very hot. I've, I've heard a lot of people say or ask, are they getting ready to swarm? No, they're just hot. You know, I hang out on the porch too when I'm hot. Um, or you may have just done a formic acid treatment of, you know, formic pro and everybody's trying to get away from the stinky smell. But most of these observations related to the entrance activity are related to colony strength. How many bees are in that hive? That's colony strength. So next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna pop the lid. Lots of bees on the inner cover. That's a good sign. You want to see lots of bees on the inner cover. If I pop the lid and there's no bees there, I'm immediately worried and concerned about that colony. Um, you know, unless it's like extremely early in the spring or it's a brand new package or, or nuke. But I, I like to see bees on the inner cover. Um, if there's wax, white wax or light colored wax in the hole in the inner cover and between the inner cover and the top frames, that's a sign that they're on a nectar flow. So that's one of the things that I will record when I'm making my observations. I'll use the abbreviation WW. WW means white wax. And it's a good thing. Right, Indy? 
India agrees. He likes white wax because then I'll put the inner cover down and he'll lick the nectar off. <laughs> so um, let's see. Yeah, that's time to add a honey super. So lid observations, strength clues and food clues. And your honey stores. Okay, that's pretty obvious. If you've got a lot of bees, it means you've got a lot of honey. Strength and food collection are related. Large, large colonies produce lots of honey. Um, and smaller colonies don't have the resources. They're busy raising brood. They don't have that many foragers and they're not gonna bring in a crop. Um, also large colonies, very strong colonies have a much larger proportion of foragers to nurse bees than does a young colony, a weak colony. So more bees are going out and bringing in the honey. Um, so the brood nest, this is really the meat and potatoes of the whole business. And being able to read the frames of brood is what separates really good beekeepers from less experienced beekeepers. And uh, you, can, you can tell pretty much everything about a colony, their history um, and their current condition by the brood frames. Uh, queen status, the health of the colony, and that's critical. So that's where you get your health clues and your queen clues is in the brood nest. So let's take a frame of brood and evaluate it. We're going to look at a bunch of frames of brood. So that's a beautiful frame there. Lots of bees there. So before we actually move some of those bees off to look at what's underneath, we can make some observations of the bees themselves. Are they noisy? Do you pop the lid and they go, hmm, that's a clue. We'll talk about it more later. Do you pop the lid and you see a bunch of bees lifting their abdomens and fanning, fanning Nazanoff pheromone? That's also a clue. <coughs> if you pull a frame like this, are the bees running around the frame and like kind of falling off the edge? That's a clue. Are the bees on this frame not staying on the frame, but flying up and bumping you, bumping your veil, maybe stinging you? Again, another clue. All of those, just looking at the bees themselves and how the bees are behaving, how they fly, how they walk, how they, the sounds that they make, those are all clues to the status of the colony. So, and we're going to talk about that more. Okay, now we're going to look at frames. Um, I like to ask people what they think of this frame. I think most of you will agree that's a pretty good frame, right? Early spring frame or mid, mid spring frame. Beautiful frame of cat brood, nice and solid and healthy. Not much food in here, right? But you see this, there's, there's the white wax I was talking about in the corners. So they're starting to bring in a little bit of nectar and put it up here in the corners. Um, it's hard to see on this, on this particular photo, but there's also some pollen in here. Not a lot, not a lot of nectar or pollen, huge amount of brood. Also notice this, see the drone brood down at the bottom of this frame? We can tell it's drone brood, it's got the bullet shape, you know, cells, but look how solid this is, right? It's all laid in a block next to each other, just like this is solid laid in a block. Those are both signs. Those are signs that that's a queen that's on the job, not a drone layer. So only queens lay drone brood like that in a solid pattern. This is Landy. a colony. That's Landy, the, uh, yes. you can also, um, if you want on this, you can zoom in on the picture. I can? Yes, you can. If oh, you look at the little use, hand. No, yeah, yeah. Well, if you use uh, your scroll wheel, you should be able to zoom in. 
Yeah. Look at that. Just, just remember to zoom out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. A scroll. I don't have a scroll wheel, but my mouse, I can zoom. I can go up and down my, okay. Thank you, Justin. All right. So depending on the strength of this colony and, you know, how th this is a colony, I would be careful. I would watch for swarming. I'd be aware that this colony has the potential to swarm, especially if they're very strong. And I'd be sure to reverse my brood boxes. Um, you know, if I only had a few, I might use a um, Snellgrove board on them or do a Demaray technique, but uh, I'd watch them. Okay, here's another frame. Now, some people looking at this frame, especially newer beekeepers say, wow, something wrong with that. What's going on there? Here, let's zoom in. Cool. We can zoom in. Ha, oh, I like it. Okay. So you get a really good look there. And now we zoom back out again. I'm having fun with that zoom thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is a perfect frame of brood, guys. But it's open brood. Okay. It's not capped brood. So... Most Sheila wasn't seeing pictures. I see. Okay. But now she's got it. Good. So most of the time when we're looking at frames of brood, we think about capped brood, pupae. But this is a frame of beautiful open brood that hasn't been capped yet. And look at this pollen here on the outside. So this is perfectly normal. This is perfect. Whoops. That's perfectly normal. This is perfectly normal. Okay, and it's important to know what's normal before we can um, evaluate what isn't normal. All right, here's another brood frame. Now, <laughs> what kind of brood is this? Guys, somebody, somebody type in that little public chat thing. Rich is typing. Thank you, Rich. <laughs> it's drone brood, right? So is this a drone layer? Oh, Rich says no. Justin says yes. <laughs> Rich is right. Okay, this is, Mark says yes. Justin quits. Don't quit. Okay, this is a frame of solid drone brood deliberately introduced. Okay, it was a frame of drone foundation that the bees have drawn out and um i sometimes use these in drone mother colonies when raising queens because i want lots of mr rights to mate with my virgin queens so if it's a colony that's in you know the right distance from the mating yard and i really like its characteristics the bees are calm the bees are gentle they're productive um, you know, they're resistant to mites, all those good things. I'm going to give them a frame of drone foundation to draw out. So, and this is actually, whoop, okay, this is getting away from me here. Um, somewhere in here, I think I, okay, the caption to this is Sue Kobe. Sue Kobe took this photo. And if any of you know who Sue Kobe is, she's a, um, She's queen rearer, okay? She raises queens and, and did a lot of, has done a lot of genetics work. She used to be with the Univers University of Ohio, but she's now out west in California. So this frame of drone comb was deliberately introduced either as part of a queen rearing um, program or for IPM to kill varroa mites. So um, it's a perfect frame of brood. It's beautiful, solid, almost no holes, really nice frame. Okay, so um, now how about this? Is there a problem here? What do you guys think? Is this, is this a problem frame? Is there something wrong with this frame? Nobody's typing. Mark is typing. And Mark says no, and Mark is correct. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that frame. Um, this is a frame of emerging brood. So 
What's happened is queens usually start in the middle of the frame laying and they lay in a circular pattern until they get to the outside here. So the oldest brood is in the middle and that hatches out first, leaving this ring, okay, of um, pupae that will hatch out a little bit later. So this is the perfect kind of frame that you would want to use if you're introducing a new queen to your colony because these bees are on the verge of emerging. And as soon as they come out, if you've got a queen cage right here, right, I guess this is upside down. Up, oh, not quite go back. There, okay. <sighs> I'm not sure about the rolly thing anymore. Okay, but if you have a queen cage in here, very soon all kinds of bees are going to come out and they're going to see that queen and never having known any other queen, they just say mom. Okay, so they will accept her immediately. A frame of emerging brood is great to put in a mating nuke um, or, you know, if you harvest a swarm cell from a really strong colony and you want to make a nuke, if you can pull a frame like this, she's sure to be accepted. Stephen so, also asked if that is uh, honey around the outside of the frame. Uh, here? Yes. Yes, it looks like there is, there's at least there's, it's nectar, probably nectar. Um, it's no way of knowing without shaking the frame, whether it's nectar or honey, but yes, there is food on the outside and they like to do that, you know, usually they'll, and oh, okay, here's some capped honey right there in the corner, a little bit of capped honey. All right, now here's a frame. What do you guys think of this frame? Is this a problem frame? Becky's going to take a stab at, stab at it. More messenger below. Oh, okay. Yes. So, Becky, what do you think is wrong with this frame? Chalk brood. Okay. Close, but no cigar. Um, this is actually, but you're right. You've never seen it. Yes, exactly. Which is why you get you get to see it now as a picture, and hopefully you don't have to see it in your bees. Um, this is actually something called sac brood. It's a virus, um, and of course we we've, we've had the year of virus this year. Notice how it's like the the larvae have their little heads sticking up like this. It's called sac brood because if you pull one of these larvae out, um, they're, they're in a, a fluid filled sac, which, and the fluid is full of viral particles. So, um, it, you know, it's contagious. It's, it's a viral disease. There's no cure. Um, sometimes requeening will help because it, Probably just because it breaks the brood cycle and helps the bees clear it up on their on its own. Um, my own experience is sometimes treating with teramycin helps, even though teramycin is an antibiotic. Um, for some reason, you know, it's it's kind of like, you know, usually when people get pneumonia, even if it's viral pneumonia, doctors will give them antibiotics, and it sometimes can help them maybe just prevent, you know, concurrent infection. Um, we often see this, or I often see this in conjunction with European fowl brood. So those two diseases seem to like to go together, not uncommon. And speak of the devil, anybody hazard a guess what this might be since I just told you? <laughs> Megan. Megan's typing something. Yes. Ben says EFB. I don't know what happened to Megan. She she's still typing. Ben, you're right. This is European fowl brood. And there's several different strains of it. Um, so they don't all look exactly the same. Um, but this is pretty common now. You, you see how this larva is like twisted up the side of the cell. 
that and this one also same thing that's very typical of european fowl brood um it forms a scale these you know where the the larva dies and falls and kind of gets into this gummy substance at the bottom of the cell but in european fowl brood you can easily remove that scale it comes right out Megan says she, sack brood is her favorite. <laughs> I would rather, I think I'd rather have sack brood than just about anything else. It, 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 it's not usually a very serious disease. I don't think I've ever seen any colony die of sack brood. Um, this will kill them. European fowl brood will kill them, but it's treatable. And oftentimes it'll clear up. My own, you know, if you read the books, they say it clears up on its own, but my own experience is it doesn't usually clear up on its own. You have to give them an antibiotic. So European fowl brood, like American fowl brood, is a bacterial disease. Okay. Sac brood is viral. The, the fowl broods are bacterial. Um, okay. Megan says we are seeing more cases of EFB this year than normal across the nation. So our state apiarist is in touch with other inspectors through the um, apiary, is it the Apiary Inspectors of America? I think is the name of the society. So they get together and, you know, compare notes as to what is going on across the country. Um, I usually see at least one case of this a year. Um, and, and I will treat it. So, and in an operation of about a hundred or so, um, hives, it's not uncommon to have this in spring. Um, what else about EFB? Okay. This is a very, very important one for you guys to be able to recognize. Failure to recognize this one. Okay, is going to be a real issue because it'll kill not only your own bees, but everybody else's around you. Okay, who can tell me what this is? Thank you, Rich. AFB, American Fowl Brood. This here is, all right, that's the ropiness test. So you're going to take like a small twig or a toothpick. Okay, uncap one of these dying pupae and swirl around the mass and pull it out. If it if it behaves like, you know, a two-year-old's snotty nose and ropes out, that's pretty diagnostic for um, American fowl brood. American fowl brood, another bacterial disease by far the most deadly of the brood diseases. Um, you'll see these, see these discolored sunken cappings here and perforated cappings, okay? Very spotty brood pattern, lots of holes in the brood pattern. Um, that's typical of American fowl brood. In advanced cases, there's also an odor, like smelly socks or it's, it's just a nasty odor. I've got a a frame in my freezer. I, I may have, for educational purposes, I may have thrown it away. Um, but, um, and Megan says, we've not had any confirmed AFB cases this year in New Jersey, which is wonderful. I've noticed it getting less and less frequent. Um, I want to go back. because, And I think it's because a number of years ago, a lot of the queen breeders began selecting for hygienic behavior. Because in order to combat the varroa mite, we were looking for varroa sensitive hygiene. So bees which have varroa sensitive hygiene are also traditionally hygienic. And hygienic bees are more than 90% resistant to both American fowl brood and a fungal disease called chalk brood. So I think that because we're, we've been putting in a lot of the hygienic behavior and selecting for it, we're seeing fewer and fewer cases of AFB. It was certainly, 
when I started keeping bees, this was a big concern. Um, and like 40 years ago, it was pretty much the biggest concern. Before Varroa, this was what we all worried about. Um, you want to recognize this. You want to be able to know what this is. Anything, anything that doesn't look like this or this. Well, this, okay, and that. There should be a flashlight that goes off in your head and you want to identify it. You don't stop until you've identified it. You don't say, oh, there's something a little funky looking in the brood nest. I don't know what it is. You know, you find out what it is, whether you call a more experienced beekeeper or you call Megan, you know, especially if you think that it's this. You, but you must identify anything going on in your brood nest. This will kill not only your bees, but what happens if we get outbreaks of it. It's like, um, well, it's like, you know, the coronavirus, you know, it's like, but these bees have parties all on their own. It's like they all go to a bar and, you know, have a big party and infect each other because, you know, drones are going back and forth from this hive to clean hives bringing along spores in honey, okay, and pollen and propolis and contaminating other hives with it. So you got to recognize this. You got to make sure that if you have it, it gets, it gets taken care of. Okay. Now, who said, somebody said chalk brood before. Ah, Vin said chalk brood. This is chalk brood. It's pretty distinctive looking. That's which is why I say that it's kind of easy to identify. Um, you'll see each of these. Now I don't have a picture of of just the mummies, but each of these little mummified larvae. Remember, if this is lar, I think this is larval stage rather than pupil stage. I could be wrong. It could be pupil stage that gets this, but this is a fungal disease. So the the brood turns into. Um, these little mummies. Uh, some of them are white. Often you'll get gray ones in there too. Um, and um, and they the two different colors represent two sexes of the fungus, which I think is kind of interesting. Chalk brood rarely kills a colony outright, but it can debilitate it to the extent that it won't survive the winter because it won't be strong enough and it won't be able to store enough honey to make it through the winter. I've seen that happen. Um, I think like the first or second colony that I ever had got chalk brood and we were not selecting for hygienic behavior back then. Uh, Mike is saying some things. He's saying they had, they had AFB in early stage AFB up in Vermont. Mummies and fried eggs, Megan. <laughs> Yuck, it's disgusting. And AFB in Western Massachusetts, okay. So, but that's pretty distinctive, right? It looks like nothing else. And I would think that you guys can identify chalk brood. Requeening can take care of it, particularly, what really the thing to do with chalk brood is requeen with a hygienic, a hygienic line of queens, and that'll take care of it right away. Um, Okay, let's look at this frame and ask ourselves what clues are on this frame? What are we seeing here? I'm seeing we have worker brood here. This is capped worker pupae. And I've also got capped drone pupae right next to the capped worker pupae, right? So what can I conclude about this frame? Failing queen, yes, thank you. That's exactly what I can conclude, whoops. Eek. About this frame, there we go. Yes, this queen is a drone layer. Either she didn't mate properly to begin with, or, um, and she's running out of sperm, or she's old and she's running out of sperm. But either way, she's not able to fertilize those eggs. So we're looking at capped, drone brood 
in worker size cells. And how do you know they're worker size cells? Because they're adjacent to worker brood. Okay, so don't ignore this. All right, I should have said that. That should be in writing here. Don't ignore this situation. Don't say to yourself, let me give it a couple of weeks and see if it clears up on its own because it's not going to clear up. She's running out of sperm. She's not going to get more sperm. They only mate once. All right. She's not going to say, oh, I'm running out of sperm. I think I'm going to go back to the drone congregation area and get some more. Won't happen. You need to immediately take action when you see this. Okay. Find the queen, kill the queen, go to John God up in Bergen County, get yourself a new queen and put her in there. Okay, so that this colony will survive. If you let a situation like this go too long, what will happen is the strength of your colony will decrease. They'll become weak, and then they may not be strong enough to put away enough honey to make it through the winter, or the cluster will be too small and they'll lose their mobility in winter. So very important to deal with this right away. Don't just ignore it and hope it goes away. It won't. Okay, this is a classic frame of something else that's not a drone layer. Because if you look here, there's no worker brood here at all, is there? So anybody hazard a guess at what this might be? Justin and Vin are typing. Okay, laying worker. Partially correct. It's actually laying workers plural because it's never just one. It's generally several hundred laying workers. Take a real good look, okay? See how that raised bumpy pattern of, of drone brood is? That's typical, okay? Yes, laying workers with the S. I hear everybody say, I think I have a laying worker. You never have a laying worker. You have a couple of hundred laying workers. Now, the bees need to be broodless without any kind of worker brood, okay, for at least two weeks before a significant number of workers' ovaries develop and they begin to lay unfertilized eggs. There's actually, I've learned, laying workers in there all the time but the other bees police them. And as long as there's enough queen pheromone and particularly brood pheromone, the workers' ovaries don't develop and there aren't enough laying workers that they ever do even one of these cells. So you'd never know that they're in there. But, um, you know, when you've been broodless for at least a couple of weeks, so you lost your queen, and all her brood hatched out, so that's three weeks, and then you got another two weeks with no brood, this is what happens. It's a last-ditch effort on the part of the colony to get their genetics out there because the workers' ovaries develop, they begin to lay. Of course, those eggs are not fertilized, so they give rise to drones, small drones, okay, substandard drones, but maybe one of those drones will get out and mate with a queen somewhere and so the genetics of this colony stands a chance of getting passed on. Brood cycle is three weeks, and then you've, you've got another two weeks. So you haven't looked in there for five weeks if you see this. And I'm going to say you need to inspect your bees more often. You guys shouldn't ever be seeing this, okay, because you should have caught it when there was a problem in the brood nest or when you lost your queen. Yes, PowerPoint will be available to refer to. So telling the difference. Oh, Justin, I'm messing this up. How do I get back to where I was? What did you do? Well, this isn't the whole um, title. Oh, zoom out. I'm trying. It's not zooming. Uh... It should say telling the difference between laying workers and drone layers. See, it's not going 
back. I don't know why. I just well, I just took uh, control. Uh, that's all that's on that slide. Really? Yeah. Uh, bubble, bubble, all right, I'll have check. to fix. I'll have to fix that. Somehow I lost the top the top line of this. So I'll I'll have to go back and fix it. Um, um you know what? It's correct in the uh, in the downloaded version. I'm not okay. sure. Yeah, all I'm right, not sure good. why that cut off here. Um, okay. And I'll post a link before the meeting is over as to where people can pick up this PowerPoint. Okay, good. Sarah was asking about that. Um, so the correct title to this should be um, Drone Layer Versus Laying Workers, Telling the Difference. So here's your drone layer, and you can see you've got drone brood in the middle of worker brood. Over here, there's with the laying workers, there's no worker brood at all. Um, and you can see the bumpy appearance of this and the, the drone brood is scattered. It's a cell here, a cell there, a cell here. Over here, this is drone brood laid by a queen and you can see that these are all adjacent to one another, okay? So queens lay brood in clumps, even if it's drone brood and they're running out of sperm, they still lay it in groups. They've got a, a method to their madness. Laying workers are rogues, you know, everybody's doing their own thing. They're not thinking about what anybody else is doing. Oh, I'm gonna lay an egg over here. I'm gonna lay an egg over here. Oh, I don't care what, you laid, you laid an egg there? You laid a bunch of eggs there? No problem, I'm laying them over here. So um, another characteristic of laying workers is you will see multiple eggs in a cell and you'll see them along the sides of the cell rather than the bottom because they're workers, they don't have the long abdomen and they can't get the eggs down at the bottom of the cell the way a queen can. Um, however, very young queens that have just started laying often lay multiple eggs in a cell. They'll do that for a day or two. So, but they always lay them right at the bottom. And you can get, you know, four, five, six cell eggs in a cell laid by a queen. Um, laying workers, you'll, you'll get a ton, but they'll be along the sides. Many will be on the sides of the cell. So that's another way of telling the difference. Um, let's see. Okay, last frame here, and I am gonna zoom in on this so you can see what's in the middle of this frame. Okay, you guys can see that there's there's brood out here, some drone brood, there's worker brood here. Um, and remember in spring, they'll lay more drone brood. So just seeing drone brood in and of itself is not an issue. It's when you see drone brood like this, in the middle of worker brood, that's when you have to be careful. That's when there's a problem. This is properly laid drone brood in a clump in spring. Um, so look here, you can see that there's nectar in these cells in the middle. And here's your, you know, this is your brood nest right here. This is where the brood should be on the frame. So what happened here? Can anybody hazard a guess as to why there's nectar in the middle of the brood nest where there should be eggs and larvae. Nectar bound, okay. And what does that mean? But look, up here, I'm not seeing a ton of nectar up here. And they could put more nectar up here. Why do they have it in the brood nest? They're backfilling with nectar after the brood emerges and there's a strong flow. Okay, could be that. Let me tell you something else about this colony. There's no eggs and there's no young larvae. In fact, there's no larvae at all. There's just capped brood, just capped brood and there's nectar where there should be eggs and larvae. Coming out of winter? No, probably not.
queenless slash virgin queen if queen cells are visible. Okay. The queen got into the supers. Maybe. <laughs> All right. Pay attention, guys, because all of you will see this. And many of you probably saw it this spring or would have seen it had you been looking. What happened here, this colony swarmed. Or they superseded their queen. Okay, so no open brood of any kind on any frame. No eggs, no larvae. May or may not have cat brood. You can't find a queen. House bees are jamming the brood nest with nectar and sometimes pollen. Are they queenless? Are they queenless? Nine out of 10 new beekeepers seeing this situation will get on the phone and call up and say, Landy, do you have a queen? Or do you know where I can get a queen? I think I'm queenless. Maybe you really are. But if this happens in spring and it's a nice strong colony, you probably are not queenless. You probably have a virgin queen. So typical and nine times out of 10, that's the answer. Wait two weeks and you're gonna see eggs. So what probably happened is the bees swarmed. The bees swarmed. Now, if you're tracking the numbers of frames covered in bees, you're gonna know that your bees swarmed, right? Once they swarm, and they swarm when there's a nectar flow, right? There's lots of food coming in. It's a great time to reproduce and look for a new home. So you're tracking that and you notice they've swarmed and you see this. Well, they swarm once the first cells are capped. It's another week before that the virgins emerge like five to six days <clears throat> and then another couple of weeks before that that queen that new virgin queen flies to mate so it's three weeks from this time of the swarm before you can expect to see your first egg three weeks you have to be patient and wait right you gotta wait so the bee swarm there's a virgin queen present sometimes um the queen has been superseded so it's not necessarily a swarm justin pointed out you want to look for queen cells if queen cells are visible that's you know that's a great clue so you go searching through and you see open cells open queen cells well okay you probably got a virgin in there um but regardless you have to wait right you have to wait for them to mate so how can you tell if there's a virgin couple of ways you can tell. Um, the difference between a colony with a virgin queen and a truly queenless colony. Number one, the real queenless bees are usually noisy. They're so noisy and it's so common that we call it the queenless roar. You'll see that um, phrase used in the literature. And it really is, you know, you pop the lid and 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 you open up the, the outer cover and they go they they're very noisy um they act nervous and unhappy i don't know how to describe this to you but they're not calm they're not gentle and and still on the frames they run around they'll sting you more um and they very frequently do this they lift their abdomens right when you pop the lid okay They'll lift their abdomens and fan Nasanoff substance. Okay, so they fan their wings and they get that come hither pheromone in there because they don't have any queen substance. That's what holds the colony together is that queen substance. There's no queen substance in there. The Nasanoff pheromone keeps them together. Okay, so those are a couple of behavior clues are a couple of ways of um did i shake them down and okay we're looking <laughs> trying to read the comments here but i shouldn't be reading the comments um i can't help it okay so bees with a virgin are often more testy than a queen right colony but so you may take one or two more stings but they're generally it's like they know things are in the works and it's all going to be okay so 
they're not nearly as unhappy as a truly queenless colony. Be patient um, and, and count, okay? If you can estimate when they swarmed, look at the calendar and make a note. Three weeks from the time they swarmed, they should have eggs. Four at the very most. If they don't have eggs after four weeks, you got a problem and you definitely want to give them a new queen. Because even if there is a queen in there, um, she'll never be any good. Dan said something uh, good, which is that there are times to be patient and times when you have to act. He is absolutely right. And I would be remiss if I didn't point out that if the bees are making queen cells, uh, there's it, you know, they don't make them overnight. It takes them a good amount of time to make those cells. And hopefully you've seen that on an inspection prior yes. to this happening. Yes. Hopefully you have been di diligent and, you know, done your swarm management, reverse brood boxes, but you know what this is biology this is this is the reproductive imperative um of every living organism to reproduce and you can you can do all the swarm management in the world and some of them are going to swarm anyway so as we all discovered this year right we had a lot of swarms this year um so that's one way, right? The behavior cues of knowing, do I have a virgin queen? You're not gonna see that virgin, chances are, um, or am I truly queenless? So virgins take a couple of weeks, two, maybe even three weeks to mate after emerging. They're very hard to spot. They run around, nobody pays any attention to them. So there's no queen retinue as there is like with a mated queen. They're smaller than mated queens. And um, just make the assumption that if you have a virgin in the colony, you're probably not going to see her. You will be lucky if you see her. Um, so one of the most common mistakes new beekeepers make is to assume that a colony is queenless when they actually have a virgin queen. Very, very common mistake. Probably the most common. So... How do you know for sure? That behavior cues, those are kind of nebulous things. You could be mistaken about that. Well, here's a surefire way of finding out. Go to your other colony, and I hope all of you have at least one other colony. Find yourself a frame of eggs and very young brood, what we call milk brood, swimming in royal jelly, just a day or two old, those larvae. Take that frame, make sure the queen isn't on it, give it to the colony that you suspect may not have a queen, mark it so you know which one it is, come back a few days later and take a look, pull it out and see if they've started a queen cell on it. Started a queen cell on that frame using that young brood, you really are queenless, okay? So at that point, you can go buy a mated queen if you want to speed things up and give it to them. If they have not started a cell on that frame of open brood, there's a virgin in there. They already have a queen. They're not going to start a new one. Okay. So, how will we recognize and remember all these clues? We'll observe, record our observations, and check the results later. And You'll have this PowerPoint because Justin will post it on the website and you can go back and look. Okay, <laughs> that's it. Thank you all very much. And any questions? Before we get into questions, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to post in the chat a link to uh, where you can access all of the chapter documents. I'm just going to remind everybody once again, you can find all of this at any time from the Essex website by clicking on the button that says news at the top and then meeting documents. Mm -hmm. um, I have uploaded Landy's presentation from tonight into there. Um, so if you want to go download it right now, go download it. <laughs> um, you will find all of the past presentations, including one that John gave, John Gott gave, I think, last year about swarming myths. 
And uh, do you remember that? I'm trying to think. It was really good. He discussed a lot of the, uh, or maybe it wasn't about swarming myths, but it was. No, uh, not swarming myths. He, um, well, he gave us a talk about um, queen rearing. He did, but he also discussed, um, he really went into depth about virgin queens and um, it might have been in the queen rearing one. Anyway, it's there, there are some excellent presentations in here if you want to. Okay get into more specific topics, especially when it comes to the Virgin Queens. Cool. Yeah, Virgin Queens are, they're tricky. I'm telling you, it's hard. They're, they're fast little things. They're very hard to spot, even in a mating nuke. Even in a mating nuke, a five frame mating nuke, I sometimes can't find the queen. Because you'd think I could find her, but sometimes I can't. Most of the time I find her, sometimes I can't. You can also find uh, the calendar on the website that has links to all the meeting times, dates. We have another one in two days just for beginners. If you have any kind of, you're a beginner and you have uh, any kind of questions that you'd like to ask in that format, that'll be Thursday at 7 p.m. That's, all the that's great. So all the details are there and all the details are in the newsletter that went out, which is also uploaded on the, the link that is sent in there. <laughs> So guys, I you know I wanted to to mention somebody, and I don't know if it's anybody here um tonight, somebody asked me a question a couple of months ago um about crystallized honey in the comb. And what do you do about it? And had I ever seen it? And and I was kind of um astonished and thinking maybe well maybe it was leftover you know sugar syrup from last year but i have to tell you guys i found some crystallized honey spring honey this year's spring honey that crystallized in the comb not a lot just a few frames but as i was extracting you know i i had some frames in the extractor that didn't spin out and it you know i tried it and it was crystallized so if that was you, I, I can't remember who it was that asked me about it. Um, but um, but I have to tell you, this has been a really weird year. <laughs> there, never in my life did I see honey crystallize in the frames like that. This year it did. Um, and I also got a very dark amber spring wildflower right after the black locust. Have no idea what it is. Odd year. Jim says, I have two small colonies. One is a split and one was a swarm. The swarm is being robbed really badly and I'm having a hard time stopping it. Any clues what's going on with the colony and why they can't defend themselves? The swarm was very strong and large. Um, and the swarm is the one that's being robbed. Robbing is a real problem. Um, you know, to, you could try putting on a um, robbing screen, but um, Jim, I know where you are. You're you're in Booton Township, so um, you have some room. Probably the very best way to stop it is to open feed. Jean got that dark honey. You think it tastes weird? I thought it tasted pretty good. But it wasn't super dark. It was dark amber. It wasn't as dark as like Japanese bamboo. You know, it's funny you got dark honey because Lynn and I up here in New York, we got a, a incredibly light honey. I got light honey too. That was my black locust. But right after the black locust, I got this darker honey. Jean says it tastes like it has whiskey in it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, Jim, try open feeding. You know, if you're in a position where you have the land um, that you can safely open feed, that will stop robbing dead in its tracks because the bees think it's a nectar flow. And just make sure, you know, you can put entrance reducers on weaker colonies or use a robbing screen. 
make sure, you know, if you have any older equipment with holes in it, duct taped the holes shut, don't have an upper entrance, make sure there's, you know, everything is flat and sealed and it's just, it's all, you did all that. Yeah. Spotted lantern fly nectar. <laughs> That's crazy. Everybody got a mixed bag. The light and the amber. The amber is more complicated. I would agree. I liked it. I thought it. I thought it was. I thought it had a really delicious flavor. I don't like it as well as the um, tulip poplar we got last year, which had that tangy, lemony flavor. But it was very rich. I thought it was delicious. Spotted lantern fly nectar. <laughs> you guys are a hoot. And Sheila says, I inspected today and have capped queen cells on the bottom of frames. I'm sure they swarmed already. There are less bees. Will they be able to build up numbers for winter? Um, Sheila, I would ask, number one, do you, are you still on a nectar flow? Okay, some of my, my locations are still getting nectar. Not a lot, but in dearth. Um, you're probably going to have to feed them. And make sure you treat for Varroa. All of you should have treated for Varroa at this point. Um, and that's been complicated, too, because of the heat. Um, it's made it very difficult. I've had, you know, had to do it with um, Apigard. And if you can use Apivar. We talked about this last month or month before, I think. But it's... You know, it's a tricky formic acid. I'm going to put some on on um, Saturday. I think I've got a three day window of decent temperatures starting Saturday, um, but uh, it's it's been very dicey with formic acid. Um, pulling out capped honey tomorrow. We'll start feeding the strong guys. That's yeah. You definitely want it. You want to have your honey off. You want to have your my treatments on. Where can I get the honey that tastes like whiskey? Ask Jean. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. How much do you feed if you're expecting a fall flow? Well, Number one, it's always dicey to expect a fall flow. I've expected it and not had it um, materialize. And then I've not expected it and had it materialize. So what I do is I will, I, I like to feed my bees. I like, I like to open feed my bees, okay, or barrel feed them during dearth while I'm treating or just after I have treated for Varroa mites because the open feeding stimulates the queens to lay. And at this time of year, the queens are laying the brood that will become the bees that feed the winter bees. One of the things that Varroa does is it damages brood food glands. And one of the things that is really important is to have Bees that have never been parasitized and are very well nourished to get through the winter. So they have to be well fed, which means they have to have been fed by nurse bees that have never seen a varroa mite on them. Those bees are being raised now. And if we open feed by stimulating the queens to lay a lot of brood, we're making a lot of good, healthy nurse bees to raise the winter bees. So that's why I like to feed. That's one reason I like to feed now. It also gets the hive full of food. So if there is a nectar flow in fall, I just stop feeding. I know they're heavy and I can add honey supers and get some fall honey. If they're not heavy enough, then I don't add the honey super and let them, you know, if I'm getting a fall flow, 
then I that nectar is going into the brood nest. So either way, I know that the bees will be nice and heavy for winter. So in other words, feed anyway. And if there yeah. is a strong flow, you can put supers on and get a full crop. And if there exactly. isn't, your bees are well fed. That's right. That's right. So better to be better to feed and be safe than sorry and hungry. I agree. So okay. I treated with Apovar July 20th. In this heat, should I check the hives before I remove the Apovar at the end of this month? Well, I would be I would be taking hives regardless. Uh, no damage. So you know, checking them has nothing to do with the Apovar. Ap the Apovar is the one treatment that is is not going to harm your bees in any way, shape, or form. It's the Apigard and the Formic Pro that you have to worry about possibly damaging brood and queens. Um, won't the bees move feed into the supers? You don't have supers on. Oh, are you saying once we get, if we get a fall flow? No, typically they don't, you know, because you've, you've made sure when you're feeding, you don't have any honey supers on. You should not have honey supers on. You want that food to go in the brood nest. You know, if you have honey supers on while you're feeding, it's going to go into the honey supers. But once you've finished feeding and there is a nectar flow, you put a honey super on, they don't take the sugar syrup and move it upstairs. They'll take the nectar and put it upstairs. Do you switch to two to one syrup at any point when you open feed? I do not, Charlie. I never feed two to one syrup, but that's more a function of the way my operation is. You know, if I had, if I were, if I had, you know, a couple of hives in the backyard, I would probably feed two to one at some point. But um, I do my feeding much earlier, so I never really need to feed two to one. I, I feed early enough that they have plenty of time to ripen that honey and, and get it, you know, nice and dry uh, before I winterize them. Two to one is a pain in the neck. I'm, I'm mixing syrup up with, you know, it's hot water and sugar. I, I, I can't put it on the stove. And two to one, you you have to, you've got to cook it basically to get it in solution because it's too thick. Landy, have you seen that um, Hive Alive, their uh, feeding uh, stimulant supposedly is, um, has been shown to be effective in helping treat Nosema serrani? Really? Yeah. Now, there are actual data. There's well, there's I mean there is actual data, but it's it's the efficacy of the study is questionable. Okay. Um, but there is some data to show that it can be effective in the treatment of Nosema serrani. That's interesting. Um, yeah. I've been I'm a little I'm a little dubious just because I've seen some of these companies like make um, claims for their products that really don't have um, the scientific research to back the claims. Um, plus, I don't, you know, I have not found Nosema serrani to be an issue in any of my colonies in recent years. I think they've developed some kind of resistance to it. I have no idea how they did it, but it's it's like a non-issue. Megan, you have any, I don't know, comments or thoughts about Nosema serrani? Personally, I think it's like, like the tracheal mite. I think it's just really hard. I don't even think the researchers really understand Nosema, so um, I think a lot of beekeeping for some people can be, hey, I had success this year doing it this way. I'm going to keep doing that. Mm -hmm. and so I think with Nosema, whatever you think works for you, just go with it because the researchers really don't even understand it. Yeah. I I mean, 
I haven't had any problems. And yet when, um, you know, my hives were tested during the APHIS um, surveys, there was always some nosema. Um, but, you know, they would all winter perfectly. They'd be strong, heavy, you know, no issues, no visible signs of any problems associated with nosema. And yet I know that it was in there. So I'm not worried about it. It ain't broke. Um, like Russian, do you feed pollen substitute to stimulate brood in preparation for winter? Joseph, I do not. And the reason I don't is because we have a lot of natural pollen in fall in this area in northern New Jersey. I don't know about the south, but up here we we have goldenrod, we have aster, we have um, smartweed, we have all kinds of pollen coming in in fall. So if I look in my boxes, my three mediums, I'll often find the bottom medium full of pollen before winter. So I don't have a need to do that. Um, I believe John Gott feeds uh, pollen John does. in fall, correct? He open feeds it. The only time yeah. I feed pollen is I feed it in late winter, you know, but you know, you're right, John, like if you ask 10 different beekeepers, you'll get 10 different answers. Um, I like the way he does it. He feeds it in powder form um, outside the hive. So, you know, like a bird feeder, he restocks the feeder with pollen substitute. And if the bees want it, they take it. And if they don't, they don't take it. And it doesn't create small hive beetle problems because it's not in hive feeding. <coughs> um, Apivar is safer for the queen than Formic Pro? Yes, absolutely. Um, Apivar doesn't do anything to queens or brood. Formic Pro, if it's a weak colony, can kill the whole colony. <laughs> You, you have to really be careful about following the directions in Formic Pro. Apivar is, is amitraz. Okay, it's a chemical. It's, it's a hard chemical, but it is the most gentle treatment as far as the bees are concerned. It also happens to be the most effective, but it also takes two months. So if there's a fall flow and you have to put Apivar on now, you're not going to get any fall honey can't have Apivar and Honey Supers on at the same time. Um, all right. Are there any um, more burning questions? Because I think I'm about to lose my voice. Jim collected a small swarm yesterday. Yeah, four medium frames. Is there enough time to move them to a 10 frame box or keep them in five frame brood box for the winter? I would make a nuke out of them. You've got a, a small four medium frames. I would I would super them and feed them like crazy. Open feed them like crazy and you might be able to winter them as a nuke. Thank you, Megan. Overwinter in a nuke double high. I agree. Oxalic acid, Rich, Rich is saying oxalic with a question mark. Oxalic is really only effective if, if they're broodless. Treat the swarm, good point. Swarm could hey, even be an abscontion. Yeah, I was gonna say a lot of the swarms that we see now and even into September are bees that are absconding from a colony and they're usually leaving because they're trying to get away yeah. uh, from some type of disease pressure. So I know a lot of the research I did, I saw colonies that would come in like 15 mites per 100 in swarms that were late season. So just heads up. Insurance at this point. Insurance at this point. I think uh, I, I think that's about, uh, about late enough. Um, if there are any more questions, we do have that second Thursday meeting. Um, Feel free to ask them it's the point of that meeting. Uh, but I think Landy is, is fading. <laughs> <laughs> Landy's so, definitely fading. <laughs> okay. Thank Pray you. For ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation, Landy. Thank 
Thank you, guys. Um, I miss you guys. I really, I can't wait until we can actually see each other in person and eat pizza and, you know, and just hang out. I really miss that. <laughs> Good night, guys. Thank you. Good night, everybody. I'll end the meeting, Landy. Okay, thanks, Justin. No problem. Bye. Everybody be well.